supporting partners all together committed to fight climate change and to work towards a more resilient and low emission society. So the unprecedented scale and the scope of action that is needed to tackle the challenges that we are facing caused to climate change and they were facing today really leaves no question we need to all act together and all, net, all hands are needed on deck. This is of course not about only raising commitment, but most of all it's about accelerating actions across sectors, across level of government and across all parts of our society. This is not just a challenge, but it also represents an incredible opportunity to truly drive forward a transformation that will influence the future of our societies like never before, both from an environmental perspective, an economic perspective, and also from a, so, uh, from a social point of view. Of course, local governments and cities have a, a key and essential role to play in supporting and in leading the delivery of this transformation, as well as in reaching the objectives of the Paris Agreement at the speed and at the scale required. They are not only home to the largest part of our uh, global population, but they are also very often the place where most of the emissions are being generated, and at the same time, the, the places where climate change is hitting the hardest. So they act not only as uh, uh, administrators, but also they lead by example. They provide services to the community that they serve and also act as catalyzers for action and drivers of innovation. On top of that, they are often faced with a lot of challenges that are the result, of course, of climate change. And we see that on our news, unfortunately, in an increasing manner in the past years. But also they act as a first responders, as firefighters, when it comes to these disasters being implemented, being taking place on the ground. This is why it's so essential to discuss not not only how we can mitigate the actions, but in particular, what are local governments doing to help reduce and assess the risk that we have from climate change and the combination of all the other unfortunate crises that they have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. We, we had a pandemic very, very recently. We see the issues that we have at the moment uh, across the globe with our energy markets. How can they work together to fight these different challenges, but also how they be including measures that can truly deliver on, on these different uh, challenges that they are facing on the ground to the climate and energy action plans on a day-to-day -day basis. So we will talk a little bit about uh, what is the role of the climate strategies the local governments are developing and how are they helping them and supporting them in really understanding what delivery pathways are out there to perform uh, the, the measure, the tasks, to really bring forward the implementation that is needed for our communities. What are the achievements that they managed to accomplish so far? So a lot of great inspirations and best examples that will be shared with us today, but also to reflect a little bit on the challenges that they are already facing on a day-to-day -day basis and how they plan to overcome them across the board. So to answer all of these very difficult questions, but also to inspire us and to share with us their knowledge and their real life experience. We have today a wonderful panel uh, of, of great panelists that are joining me online. Uh, I will start by introducing the mayor of Tokurozawa, Japan, uh, Mr. Masato Fujimoto. Thank you very much for being with us. We also have the pleasure to have in our panel the deputy mayor of Budapest, Hungary, Ms. Katatuto also important representative within uh, the European Committee of the Region. So thank you for being here in both of your uh, best today. Uh, we are happy to welcome the Mayor of Kilimane from Mozambique, Mr. Manuel de Araujo. We also have the pleasure to welcome with us the Mayor of Irbit, Jordan, Dr. Nabil Kufi. We have with us connected also the Deputy Mayor of Bucha, Ukraine, Ms. Mikhaila Skriko uh, Travaska. And then finally, uh, last but by no means the least, the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, Australia, connected with us, Ms. Nuatali Nua Nua Elmes. And it's a true pleasure to have you all on the line today, and we look forward to discussing with you. Before we begin our uh, conversation of today, 
Uh, we would like to, uh, I would also would like to uh, acknowledge a couple of colleagues that are also on the line with me today, uh, Asma Ginia, uh, also from the Global Covenant of Mayors, and Guido Mattei, another colleague from the Global Covenant of Mayors, who will be supporting the management of this session. Asma will help me co-moderate part of the activities and the discussion of today, and Guido will be there to really try to capture your questions and your comments via our interaction mode. And I don't want to already spoil uh, what we expect from all of you participating on the ground, of course, but we will be launching uh, a Slido survey very soon to also understand uh, together with you what are your feelings around the most common hazards that you are seeing the cities across the world facing on a day-to-day -day basis. So after that introduction, I would like to take really no further time and really give as much as possible the opportunity to our panelists to share uh, their experiences and their vision. So we will start uh, with, a, with a run through um, from all of our panelists, a two minutes really brief snapshot of the experiences that our cities from across the world are facing when it comes to disaster risk reduction and the way that these are of course, uh, not only uh, challenging in our cities, but also that they are being responsible. So I would like to start uh, by Mr. Masato Fujimoto, please. I will give you the floor for your introduction. Thank you very much once again for being with us, and we look forward to hearing from you. Mr. Fujimoto, I'm sorry, but I believe you are on mute. Hello, I'm, my, my name is Masato Fujimoto Miya of Tokorozawa in Japan. It is my great honor to be here uh, Tokorozawa city is suburb of Tokyo, located 30 kilometers from Tokyo, with a population of 340,000. Our city is a hot region of Japan due to the combination of the fan phenomenon and the heat island effect. The air temperature sometimes gets higher than body temperature, about 40 degrees Celsius. There are three streams in our city, which always have risks of overflowing during rainstorms or typhoons. The flooded roads have also been increasing these days. That's it. Thank you very much for already highlighting one of the many challenges that our cities across the world are facing. Flooding is something that brings us unfortunately all very much together in seeing the impacts, not only on our infrastructures, but in particular in our communities and our cities with a lot of, of course, loss, both from an economic perspective, but even uh, more gravely uh, from a, a human perspective, of course. So thank you very much for, for keep getting us started with your uh, short introduction to the, uh, to the challenges faced. And I would like now to go to, to Ms. Catatuto to hear a little bit uh, about uh, the challenges faced by Budapest. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, Budapest and all of our European cities have a common goal. European goal is to become climate neutral by 2050. For this, we are all putting together plans. It has four pillars, all these climate plans. One pillar of mitigation, so to reduce emissions, adaptation, biodiversity, and the social pillar. Today, we're talking about this adaptation pillar of disaster risk, what we are facing. In Budapest, I am focusing on water now because water is a thing we were always thinking about. We have plenty of and we, they will never have a problem with. We have a big river. We drink uh, the water. And these summers brought us droughts and uh, times when we had like no water. So and all of our cities is built to run off water. And now we are changing to become sort of sponge cities to reserve water, to keep water, and rethink our surfaces so it's not draining it off with all the sealed surfaces, using nature-based solutions and 
also participation in it. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting this other dimension, of course, uh, related to, to, to water and the measure that you are implementing on the ground to try to, to face these challenges. But also thank you for already pointing the point, uh, pinpointing the issue connected to the social dimension, of course, of the risk and vulnerabilities that we have on our ground. So looking forward to hearing more about your experience. I would like, now like to go uh, to travel a little bit towards the southern part of the world and ask uh, the mayor of Kilimane, Manuela de Araujo, to please share his perspective. I will ask just a second, mayor, because you and I are sharing the same room. So I need to make sure that I'm muted to avoid any echo. Thank you very much for inviting me for this distinguished uh, panel. Uh, well, Kelimane city is a, a coastal city in the middle of Mozambique, and uh, it has got uh, challenges in terms of climate change or, and extreme events due to its geographical location. Because Kelimane uh, is uh, at an estuary, because the Zambezi River, which is one of the biggest rivers in Mozambique, joins the Indian Ocean into a delta. And Kelimane City was built on the banks of one of the rivers coming from the Zambezi River. And actually, literally, I will call it, the city was built on a swamp. So we suffer a lot when there are extreme events, namely when there are storms, cyclones, so like, you know, uh, rain causes flooding. But also because we are a coastal city, we suffer flooding for when the sea rises. And actually, sometimes it happens that uh, the stormwater flooding coincide with the sea rise level. So creating a almost catastrophic uh, challenge for us. And uh, we have been working a lot. So we have got, we are one of the first cities in, in Mozambique with a, a local adaptation plan. And uh, under that plan, we have several activities from education to prevention, but also adaptation and uh, some ac activities on mitigation. But one of the biggest and the most important projects that we do have is to do with mangrove reforestation. And I mentioned mangrove, we chose mangroves because mangroves are the first line of defense against erosion in my city. So we've been educating the citizens on how not to cut mangroves because actually given the level of poverty in my city but also in the province people cut mangroves for cooking but also to use the mangrove wood to build their own houses and one of the challenges what they asked me they as a mayor at a meeting one of those meetings where i was trying to convince them not to cut mangrove was mayor do mangroves vote? And of course, for a politician, it's a, 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 a tricky question because they are, in other words, they were trying to find out why was I so concerned about mangroves, spending money on mangroves instead of giving that money and my time to improve their livelihood. So I had to explain to them the importance of the mangroves, both for as a first line of defense of my city, and secondly, because 60% of the citizens of my city, they get their livelihoods and their incomes from fisheries. And actually, fish and other crustaceans, they reproduce themselves in the mangroves. So I had tell them that if they cut mangroves, we are going to have no more fish. And if we don't have fish, they will not have their livelihood guaranteed. So. By doing that, I managed to link and to show them that uh, taking care of mangroves is also improving the conditions of their livelihood and income in short, medium, and in, 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 in the long term. So in short, yes, mangroves do vote too. very much for uh, not only bringing up 
uh, another example of how nature-based solutions are essential element in trying to really uh, build our resilience, but also in tackling some of the vulnerabilities that we have due to climate change and also for painting such a vivid picture, of course, of, of some of these uh, solutions and how they impact directly, not only in the responsiveness of your city, but also in the way that the citizens need to be brought on board to understand why this response is needed. And we continue our journey of learning more about how our cities, listening to their voices, how are they tackling uh, issues related to risk and vulnerabilities. And we travel now uh, um, a little bit further <laughs> and we travel to Australia, where we will hear now the voice of uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor of Newcastle, as I mentioned before, Ms. Uh, nu Nuatali Nelmes. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. What is the experience of Newcastle when it comes to addressing risk and vulnerabilities? Well, thank you very much for having me on this distinguished panel. Uh, it's wonderful to be coming to you uh, from down under. The time zone here, it's midnight in Australia at the moment. So um, it's very dark outside. So I think you're all in daylight hours uh, and enjoying your time in your countries or in Egypt. Uh, we have very similar challenges. Uh, Newcastle is situated on our east coast in Australia, and it's two hours by car north of Sydney just to locate us. And it's one of the largest uh, exporting ports on the east coast, but it's also uh, the mouth of a river and also a very um, picturesque coastal area. So we've actually in recent years seen our sea levels rise, um, the storm surges rise, uh, we've had significant coastal erosion. We have actually lost community infrastructure due to coastal erosion. So they're um, on an open water coastline like the Pacific Ocean. They're really big infrastructure challenges in terms of funding. Uh, we also uh, in Australia aren't immune uh, to flooding and bushfires. And there are a number of really low lying areas um, in the city that are part of what would have been an estuary area before it was uh, obviously populated. So we have quite similar challenges, I think, to other coastal cities on these type of um, geographical areas. For us also, uh, part of our uh, work that we're doing in our uh, our climate action plan is also around the need uh, for the social side and the transition. Uh, we are one of the largest coal exporting ports uh, in the world, and we have uh, over 14,000 jobs tied to the energy sector in Australia. So for us, it's there is the social and the job side around the transition to renewable, and the targets we have set uh, for the city uh, net zero by 2030. And we have done that through 100% renewable electricity supply for our own operations, um, really looking at waste reduction and the like. But I think the real challenges, are, and I'm assuming for a lot of cities around the world, is going to be the adaption and mitigation, just purely due to the, the cost of the infrastructure and the time it takes to plan and implement it. But it is, um, it's wonderful to be part of the Global Covenant of Mayors. Um, here we come together as a group known as Oceana. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for connecting with us so late at night, but it's indeed a very important conversation to have. And it's also very uh, remarkable how we're talking about localities that are so far apart geographically, but that really are facing some of these essential questions all at the same time and all to really try to find also holistic responses that are not just looking into, of course, infrastructural response, but also ways to, to involve the society uh, in, the, in the best possible way. So I will go now next to, to uh, our next speaker, and it's my pleasure to give the floor uh, to Ms. Uh, Mikaelna, the mayor of Bucha. I'm so sorry, I am being really ruining your name and not pronouncing it correctly, it's a complex one, but I also know that you are facing a very complex situation right now. So it's not just about, of course, disaster uh, brought by by climate change, but as I mentioned in my introduction, unfortunately, local governments are at the crossroads really trying to unravel this complexity of different crises that we are living and of course uh, conflicts uh, are, are equally important when it comes to, to looking into the, the future of the resilience of our society so we look forward to, to hearing from you and uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us.
I'm afraid you are on mute. Good afternoon to everybody. We have day, we have light outside, and that's a big privilege to be with uh, all of you because yesterday we had really a hard attack from Russia on the capital of Ukraine, on Kyiv, and we were without electricity for a long time. So it's uh, the biggest challenge for us uh, now how to live, how to deal, and how to uh, organize a comf comfortable life in blackout. Uh, so, um, Bucha, as a city, it's very close to Kyiv. It's like 30 kilometers from the capital of Ukraine, uh, uh, almost exactly like uh, Torokozawa uh, to Tokyo. Uh, so, we are a suburb. And we were like green and comfortable suburb before full scale invasion. So foresty area with lots of rivers, but all our rivers are irrigated. So we also uh, deal with water problem and think how to keep the water and uh, how to um, improve water supply for our citizens in the situation of blackout, in the situation of uh, uh, war because Bucha was occupied in um, March and we were staying without electricity, gas, a mobile connection, without anything for more than 30 days, uh, for almost two months. And we had this experience how to survive without no, uh, no one of uh, normal scene in comfortable uh, modern city. So we, um, we are also as a country, um, plan to join the European Union. Uh, maybe you have heard that we signed an agreement this year and for us is very important experience of European cities. Uh, we would like to learn uh, the best practices and implement them in Bucha and in Ukraine as well. And also we want to um, we, we realize that cl climate change is affecting us very much because, for example, now in November, we have very warm autumn and it's good for us because it, we could save the energy, but we see very bad signal globally because now uh, we were like in forest area with lots of uh, pine trees, for example, but now it's more comfortable for the subtropical uh, plants not for typical our um, uh, trees. And we see a big uh, threat in that. Uh, so we are very happy to be on this discussion and we want to learn from all of you how to maintain this green uh, and comfortable life here in new situation when uh, war and global climate change is changing everything. Well, thank you very much for, for being with us also in these very complex and difficult circumstances. And uh, uh, it's, it's remarkable how uh, local governments in any situation, in any condition, with any disaster, with any uh, challenge they are facing, they still don't lose their appetite to learn from one, from one another and to really try to, to build together uh, better solutions, future solutions to support our cities and our municipalities. So I hope this is also building a little brick in the, in the, in the, in the large uh, offer that, of course, local governments can provide in terms of providing best practices, but also uh, encouragement to fail forward, but always together. So thank you for being with us, uh, Ms. Michaela. Uh, I would now like to see if we uh, have with us the mayor of Irbid, Mr. Uh, Dr. Nabil Al-Kofahi. I understand that there were some technical issues, but I just wanted to double check if we are able to hear your very interesting and important experience. Mayor, are you with us? I can see you, I believe, connected on your iPhone. I'm afraid you are muted, though. I thank you for all uh, colleagues. Thank you for all mayors. I am uh, very pleased uh, to meet all uh, my colleagues here in this uh, conference and this workshop via uh, Zoom. Uh, maybe uh, I have some uh, disconnection in the uh, internet that I am in Tunisia now, but uh, I try to be in uh, contact with you 
in my city, I am a mayor of Urban City from Jordan. Uh, here in our city, we have uh, many uh, items uh, to uh, work in uh, about green building and we uh, uh, my our uh, vision to uh, 2030 in uh, the future that our uh, city must to be a uh, green smart attractive to investment and uh, uh, achieving happiness for a uh, human being uh, uh, many uh, items that related to this uh, vision one of that the uh, green building we uh, began from uh, uh, some years before to uh, convert all our buildings uh, as uh, uh, LED uh, lighting for all the buildings. Now in all the streets in our city, in the greater urban municipality, we uh, began to uh, put LED uh, saving uh, energy for all uh, columns uh, for the lighting street. Besides that, we uh, aim to convert all the lightings in the, our uh, building who, which uh, belong to our municipality as uh, LED to save the energy. The uh, second thing uh, related to transportation. Uh, all of us know about the CO2 that uh, we, we try to convert and encourage the people to use the public transportation in the city and we now to reallocate all the street direction and uh, as one way or two way and to have a special lane for buses and uh, the public transportation to uh, uh, to uh, uh, reduce the emission of the uh, many vehicles that uh, use the streets in our city the uh, other thing we uh, go to is uh, to uh, solve the traffic congestion in our uh, city there were uh, there are many points that uh, uh, represent as a traffic congestion and uh, all of us know that the, uh, to uh, lose the time as uh, inter at the intersection or the street or roads this uh, need to uh, more use for the uh, fuel uh, other things that relate to solid waste management we began uh, from uh, uh, four, four years before to uh, have uh, to recycle many uh, uh, waste as uh, uh, plastic, as carton, uh, as uh, some vegetables and uh, trees to uh, recycle these. And we encourage all people in our uh, greater urban municipality to uh, be sharing with the municipality and to uh, recycle many things to save this thing. Uh, other things, uh, the, the four or five things that related to water drinking, we, we, we have uh, uh, many wells in our city that will uh, feed the uh, drinking uh, system network for more potable uh, water and more clean water that also need to go uh, to enlarge and expanded the drinking water network for all uh, the houses or homes around the city which not uh, ha which uh, haven't any drinking water water at the uh, far of the city thank you so uh, much that, for that, for your the, contribution the thing is, uh, what please please if you want to conclude with the last point <laughs> Vegetation, vegetation, we have uh, to plant many trees, we have to uh, plant the old street uh, in our uh, city to uh, encourage the people to plant uh, uh, around their uh, home uh, in uh, the uh, city and to encourage all the farmer to uh, uh, see how uh, to, uh, about our city to uh, think as a green uh, city. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you for all people uh, here. I am uh, very sorry about the disconnection in the internet here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And you have done a, a, a great job, you know, regardless of the difficulty with the connection, not only to present some of the challenges, but also to give us a full tour across the different solutions that you are implementing, both from a mitigation and an adaptation perspective, because let's not forget that uh, not integrating these measures is actually a risk in itself. 
So I think this is, a, this is also very good food for thought. But speaking of food for thought, we also would like, as I mentioned at the very beginning, to hear from the audience some of the food for thought that comes also from uh, to, to inspire our panelists during the discussion. And I would like now to ask my colleagues to please pull up uh, the slide uh, giving you the access to our Slido uh, account. And there is one survey uh, that is launched for all of you to respond to. And the question that we have is the following, what are the most common disasters that your city is facing? Floods, landslide, extreme temperatures or droughts, wildfires, cyclones and storms, or wave surges and tsunamis. So we want to hear from you uh, what your city is facing in terms of these vulnerabilities and these uh, uh, massive challenges, of course, and to, to also discuss, of course, with our panel, the results of uh, the state of play from across the world and see if the the picture that we managed to paint with our audience does also uh, uh, apply very much to your context and how you're finding these solutions and implementing your action on the ground. But while the colleagues are busy pulling up the, the slide and you are all busy filling in our survey, I would like maybe to kick off the conversation uh, with our panelists and uh, maybe go a little bit further uh, into uh, the discussion around the main challenges and the main solutions related to disaster risk reduction in the cities. We have already heard uh, a little bit of, of, a, of a snapshot of what the challenges are, but I would like to go back to some of the trends in these cities in particular. And Mayor, um, I would like to start with the city of Tokorozawa, if that's okay. And I would like to understand a little bit uh, what are the challenges that you have in particular in a city that is so densely populated in, uh, as an urban area? What are the challenges that you are facing and how are you reacting and putting forward measures to solve the issues that you face? The biggest challenge in our city is to prevent heat stroke Unfortunately, some citizens have died due to heat strokes since last year. Elderly people, 30% of the population, are vulnerable to heat. It is a serious matter since Japan is an aging society. Elderly people are suffered from heat, not only outside, but also inside of their house because some people prefer not to use air conditioner. If we don't use air conditioner, we do suffer from heat stroke. But if we use air conditioner, that would worsen the heat island effect. It is our challenge to break out of the dilemma. Thank you very much for uh, for bringing up this specific vulnerability. And of course, uh, we mentioned densely populated city that also means urban heat island effect affecting even further uh, the condition of the city itself. And they can also for bringing forward the important connection between climate change, of course, resilience, but also health, which is a very, uh, a very important connection when it comes to putting forward solutions. I would like to maybe continue our discussion and to further explore uh, some of the challenges, but also the solutions that are being brought forward. And I would like to move to Newcastle. You already spoke to us a little bit about the issues around coastal erosions, uh, but can you maybe tell us a little bit more about how you are furthering the activities to cope with these challenges in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So coastal erosion has been a, quite a significant issue for us. Um, the break walls, the infrastructure that is needed to operate the port uh, stops the natural replenishment of sand that's lost off the beaches, which has caused a lot of the coastal erosion. And to replenish that sand um, is quite a feat of engineering. So um, that work hasn't started, but there's a lot of uh, environmental work happening um, prior to being able to source that sand offshore, as you could imagine. For us, um, 
part of the pillars of our climate action plan uh, really not only deal with the coastal erosion issues and the environmental issues, but it's really around uh, a secure energy transition. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have a significant amount um, of employment related to the energy industry, um, particularly still in fossil fuels here in Newcastle, Australia. And we have um, committed uh, as a city uh, to the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, we have been leading the charge in sustainability here for over 20 years, um, even with that juxtaposition in the city. And it has been very fruitful and with a lot of support, obviously, from our, our residents and our population um, supporting those transition plans. Uh, we operate a uh, landfill, um, so waste management, like a lot of local government municipalities. Uh, one of um, our old uh, disused landfill sites was once a coal mine. Um, what we actually did with that site was build a five megawatt solar farm on that site. So um, that's kind of a, a metaphor uh, visually also uh, for the transition that's happened in, in the region. And we, we were with one of the first municipalities to shift to 100% renewable energy. Um, and that's uh, not just for um, buying our energy in, but that's also producing our own energy. And that's one of the bigger challenges we have here in Australia. We do have the benefit of being able to harness uh, wind and solar and lots of types of renewable energy. Uh, in Newcastle, Australia, we are connected, uh, have a lot of the connection points to the national grid. So we have a really good opportunity here in the coming years to be able to transition our city and the country and create jobs in the renewable sector, high skill jobs here in this region and actually replace that energy uh, and put it straight back in in a renewable sense into the grid here. So those are some of the, the big macro challenges on a, on a uh, more micro level uh, from an urban landscape, um, similar to uh, um, Mayor Masato in Japan, we actually have, um, unsurprisingly, very high temperatures here in Australia. So on our coastal uh, fringe, obviously our coastal sea breezes will keep the temperatures lower, but we have more people die in Australia from uh, uh, heat and the effects of heat than we do from natural disasters. So it's actually a real challenge. Uh, in some of our western suburbs, as you go further inland, uh, where there is less vegetation, more dark surfaces, road surfaces, we've started a lot of local projects involving local schools in transforming those local centres um, with a lot of uh, their uh, local input into what they'll actually look like. And we've partnered with the University of Newcastle to actually measure the reduction in heat um, that we can achieve through both the tree canopy coverings uh, as well as uh, structures and also the change in the surfaces on the roads and on the footpaths. So very um, localised, small-scale projects that have had um, really good success here in Newcastle. Well, thank you very much for sharing some of the solutions that you have implemented. And uh, I see already a potential collaboration and learning from each other's experiences with, uh, with the city of Tokorozawa. So I think we are heading in the right direction with this discussion and with this session, of course. Uh, but also thank you very much for, for sharing again uh, the importance of natural-based solutions in solving some of these different challenges and, and supporting our communities uh, in coping with some of the uh, uh, challenges related to climate change. Uh, and when it comes to first fostering re uh, resilience, and we talked about also the resilience of the energy system uh, when it comes to Newcastle in particular uh, right now and the infrastructure, but also of the future, how do we future-proof uh, our vision uh, for our cities? Um, it would be interesting also to have a reflection now from uh, the mayor of Bucha to understand a little bit energy security, energy resilience, this is very much elements at the moment uh, that, of course, are on the uh, first pages of, uh, of, of the world uh, in the difficult situation that you're, that you're facing at this moment. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you're facing that part of the challenge, but in particular, the overall uh, resilience measure that you need to deploy to support as much as possible uh, in this difficult moment of conflict in your city? Yes, as I mentioned, we are still learning how to live in new conditions because we have uh, 
lots of threats. Uh, when you don't have electricity, you are like in the medieval ages, uh, you have to use wooden ovens to heat, to cook, to do everything. Uh, you have to use generators and lots of petrol or diesel to maintain the electricity where generators are operating. And really, we are not well prepared. We don't have much of uh, new technologies to replace uh, these two um, sources of energy, you know. So um, now we are looking for the solutions, what we could do, uh, what uh, we could use in a new situation. Not only Bucha, not only Ukraine. I think that all Europe is thinking now how to uh, maintain the level of economy without Russian gas. And that's the biggest threat. And uh, of course, it's like very bad situation but at the same time it's a very good option for all of us to uh, think about new resources new technologies and new way of living globally so we could uh, find uh, good solutions for all of us in a new uh, situation because here in our part of the world we are discussing that it uh, should be the last winter when Putin could uh, terrorize Europe, not only Ukraine, but all the Europe with his uh, gas uh, um, supply. So I think that uh, good chance for the mayors and for the governments to find the proper solution and to um, go deeply in green energy technologies. And I think that together we could uh, solve this uh, situation and um, if our colleagues could uh, suggest something uh, what we could do now not wait in spring or summer or next year with in new situation because of course we understand that like uh, when we use more wood it's also threat for our foresty areas so we don't want to cut too much uh, trees to heat themselves but we might have no choice for that. So uh, if um, our colleagues could share with us their experience and could suggest us what we can do, except these two options I mentioned, it would be great. And um, uh, also we used, we started to use lots of natural um, uh, resources to collect the water. We used water from snow, water from rain, and that's also good tendency because we are saving our um, ground resources. And uh, we are thinking what we could do, how we should develop our municipal company to use all possible um, water we have around. So we are learning and uh, we are um, gathering experience from other parts of the world. And I think that's a um, new reality uh, which will uh, help Europe to be more, to, to become more self-sustainable without uh, Russian gas resources, in fact. Thank you very much for, for that. I think, again, the connection between the importance of uh, facing the risk and the, the, the we are, that we have, but also understanding how to become more resilient and the connection with the mitigation aspect uh, came about quite strongly in your statement. And this vision that we need to have also to accelerate the energy transition, of course, making sure that the correct framework is in place also for us to, to walk towards uh, the future that we want to see in a sustainable manner for all of our, uh, for our citizens and for our communities and that makes me think about a situation that might change in the future we know that the world is eating and the middle east and northern africa region will be facing a tremendous uh, uh, difficulty around the, the temperature rising and the risk of desertification that can go together with that we already talked about uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, heat waves and, and the impact on their health. So maybe uh, the mayor of uh, Irbit could share with us a little bit what are the challenges and the solutions uh, around this challenge of desertification that the city is facing. Checking if the mayor is still with us, but we might have some challenges. So while the mayor um, 
we'll see if we manage to reconnect and to hear more about this important element uh, of, of, of course, raising temperature and desertification. I would like then to also uh, pivot a little bit the question because we talked a lot about what the challenges are. We talked a lot about uh, how they are affecting and impacting our societies and what the risks are. But of course, uh, we haven't maybe zoomed in a lot on what does that mean for our population, uh, not only at large, but in particular for the most vulnerable part of our population. So I would like to ask uh, Miss um, Katatut, of course, to tell us a little bit more about what is the risk? How do we cope with it in particular for these communities? Yes, thank you very much. I've been working on gender and the Green Deal. So maybe I think um, I, I can highlight the most important findings. So what, what we are talking about, we are talking about that as from the European Union level, we are preparing to transform everything, our cities, our economies, uh, um, to become climate neutral. So we will be spending a lot of money. Uh, and this will have a strong effect on society. But we are not looking at it. How will this affect men and women? We see a lot of existing inequalities, a lot of gender inequalities. Uh, we see the pen, uh, pay gap, we see the pension gap, and it all goes back to the, to the care gap. So when we look at in measures, when we look at investments, when we look at budgets, uh, we should be looking at how will this close the gap or will this make it wider? Just to show an example what happened uh, now in this energy crisis, because yes, as the deputy mayor of Bucha said, yes, the energy crisis is especially in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, it reached local municipalities, cities, which means that even the municipalities faces challenges in providing street light and providing heating, cooling, and um, and care. So a lot of municipalities are thinking about dimming street light, cutting street light, uh, uh, and street light is not about energy, it is about safety. And the perception of safety is very, very different for men and women. Cutting street light can close in women into their homes. If I look at other measures, like having longer winter holidays to save energy for schools and nurseries and kindergartens. We've seen that in COVID uh, with the online education, who will stay at home? It will be women. If I look at uh, public transport, because public transport uses a lot of energy. So when many cities are looking at cutting public transport services, uh, who are the ma major users of public transport, it is women. So when we say that our society will carry a very big burden on their shoulders for this winter, we see that there's a big difference between men and women who will carry the bigger one. And we see that this is, this is unfair. We should look at all of these decisions with a gender perspective. And when it comes to spending a lot of money, when it comes to uh, next generation EU funds, when it comes to recovery and resiliency, we should have a gendered lens to have a fairer society in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. And I think I can uh, echo uh, everything that you have said, definitely the perception of our society and the way that we leave our communities changes very much um, uh, according to the, to the group that we, that we belong to, the, the gender that we have. The, uh, a lot of these different aspects are essential when we are talking about resilience in a way that is inclusive and that can really bring forward the sustainability that we want. So thank you very much, Ms. Tuto. Um, I have a question for the for, for Mayor uh, Araujo here with me, but I see um, um, Michalina with a with a hand raised. So if you have a, a quick reaction to, to the point made, please feel free to take the Yes, I, I, I am really thank you, Kata, for everything you have mentioned because I completely agree with you. And I'd like to um, react on streetlight uh, point. It's very important. And for example, in blackout time and saving the energy, we had to cut all the streetlights. So we are in darkness on dark streets, and we discovered that maybe we need to use more cat size and other. Uh, very cheap um, stuff to do uh, our lights uh, light uh, with very um, technological stuff. So we have solutions, but we were not implementing them well. So now we 
uh, learning, we could do that uh, globally and it will help all of us. Thank you, Kat, for that. Thank you very much also for the uh, strong but also uh, prompt reaction. So, Mayor uh, Araujo, we talked about so many different challenges. You mentioned the challenges that your city has as well. We talked about a lot of solutions that are being implemented on a day-to-day -day basis. But how come that we haven't solved, solved all of these problems since we have ideas for the solutions, we know exactly where we need to, to head. I know you have also been part of uh, the process of the recently launched Summary for Urban Policymakers. What are, what are we missing? And can we hear your perspective on that? Well, as you well pointed out, what is missing is action. And uh, action needs, of course, to be informed by the right policies and, more importantly, by data. Most of the municipalities, uh, specifically those in Global South, la lack data. And to me, data is like uh, I compare most of the times uh, mayors as either firefighters or as pilots. Like, you know, you can imagine a pilot within, I mean, uh, 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 a ship pilot on IC during a cyclone. And if he doesn't have a bussola, he will not know if he should make his effort to the left, to the right, or so like he's lost. So data, for me, it's of a paramount importance. Mayors, urban planners, and those working in local government need data. And scientists, universities, research institutions can produce data. Actually, most of this data is produced, but it's stored at the universities, at the research. So we need to bring and improve on the relationships between research, research centers, universities, and local governments. I think if we do that, then we will be moving in the right direction. The second piece that I think is missing is leadership. I think it's very important that the mayors took the lead. If we look, for example, for most of the SDGs, almost 90% of FDGs, they are implemented at the local level. Therefore, we need to include mayors and subnational officers in the debate, in the negotiations. I recall, for example, I attended first time COP15 in Copenhagen, which, which was a complete fa fa failure. Mayors who were not even allowed to enter the precinct of the place. Then we met in 2021 in Paris under the invitation of the, uh, the mayor of Paris, Mayor Hidalgo, which brought more than 500 mayors together. There also, we were not allowed to enter the premises of the negotiations, but we met outside and we made our voice to be heard. We made a declaration where we use the United Nations and the other international body to listen to the voice of the mayors because we are in the forefront of climate change. When there is a disaster, the first people to organize the citizens are mayors. And I always give the example of the city of Beira. I could give the example of Kilimani, but I prefer to give up the Beira. Because in Beira, they, Mozambique suffered the cyclone Idai. And second, I died, destroyed 90% of the city of Beira. And for full four to five days, nobody could go to Beira. Neither by air, by sea, by road, or by railway. Bridges were broken. And the roads, nobody could use the roads. You could not fly in because the weather was not good. And you could not even like use ships to get in. So it was the local mayor with his staff who had to deal with, with, with those challenges, who had to organize the citizens to cop until when the fifth, sixth day support for national institutions, support for international partners starts flowing in. So we need to capacitate, give capacity to local government to be able of responding to extreme events. We need also to fund subnational governments. It's not enough to 
capacitate, but you need to capacitate and allow to, so that local governments have got the resources that they need to manage these challenges. Of course, we need also peer-to-peer -peer exchange where those in B Bulgaria or Newcastle or can go to, for example, to Japan to learn what Japan is doing well, but also to learn from the mistakes cities in Japan are making so as to, uh, to avoid them. Those in, in the Global South should also cooperate between the Global South, but also with cities in the Global North. For example, we have got an exemplary uh, 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 case of cooperation with the Milan municipality. Next week, two en engineers from Milan municipality are coming or are going to Kelimane city to work with our engineers in order to study a strategy and a plan to, to conserve water. Because from October to April, it's raining a lot and we are having floods. But from June to October, we are having drought. So like all the water that we had during flooding goes into the, the sea. So we are discussing with the Milan municipality if they can support us or, and through them, if we could get other partners so that you know, we, we, we can have what we call basias de retention, which are places where we can retain this water. We may not use this water for drinking, but at least we can use for gardening, for urban food, for washing cars and other kind of services that normally and actually we use potable water. So then we will be saving potable water while using that water from, from, the, the, I mean, from rain for other tertiary uh, needs. Thank you very much for taking us through some of the challenges, not only that your city is, is facing, but also I really like this idea of uh, the pilot, uh, the needs uh, to have access to a proper compass uh, to take the right action and to go in the right direction, but also the importance of the wind and the waves uh, in driving that boat, right? So the technical assistance, the support, the tools, and of course the finance to also support these different measures. Um, I'm afraid that we are at, at the end of our time, a little bit over time even. Uh, so I would like to see maybe the results of the um, this slide just to have a, a quick picture from across the world of what is the results that we that we of our of our survey what are the most commonly uh, faced disasters in cities across the world i see extreme temperatures and droughts are uh, definitely felt by a large amount of our um, of our participants and audience following us online uh, followed by, of course, the uh, impacts of flood, landslides and wildfires, among others. So uh, a lot of challenges, but also I hope that all of you feel comfortable in hearing all the amazing solutions that are brought about uh, all of our mayors, all of our cities from across the world with a genuine request coming from everyone to, of course, uh, participate as much as possible in exchanges, in dialogue among each other to learn as much as possible from one another. I'm gonna give a very difficult task now to my colleague. I have introduced at the very beginning, my colleague Asma, to give us a wrap up in a minute of the main points that were discussed today. So Asma, I'm sorry, I'm being very mean to give you this difficult task. We heard so many things that it's, it's gonna be a tough challenge for you, but please, uh, uh, cope with this risk and, uh, and deliver some, <laughs> some resilience, you. some solutions. Thank you very much, Georgia. Um, so thank you very much also um, to our mayors from our GCOM cities for showcasing your excellent work um, for around uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, and we're really glad that you've been able to use this opportunity to um, raise the voices of your cities, the solutions that you're putting in place um, and showing the local leadership that requires this to be done. Um, there's some excellent concrete examples um, of what you're doing um, uh, in this space. Um, we've heard from across the globe, really, about the activities that are being carried out on the ground. Um, but we've also seen how um, this has required um, 
uh, collaboration um, at different tiers, at different levels, both vertically and horizontally. And we heard very clearly the need for sharing um, across between global South-South, but also global North-South and vice versa, South-North as well, how important it is to share the solutions, but also the challenges and the different ways that we might address this. Um, I think in particular, what, what's been very uh What's been, uh, you know, remarkable for me is for hearing from Mayor Bouchan in particular, you know, um, as Georgia said, no matter what the challenge, where you are in addressing it, frontline work from local governments and municipalities continues day to day. And so it's really, I mean, this was, there is no better way to illustrate how much we need to continue looking at climate um, action, um, even in the face of such extreme challenges. Um, and I, see, I think the four takeaways from here, um, just kind of summarizing the, the, the session, is that um, climate action plans are a vital, vital tool. Um, so uh, despite the challenges, in order to make sure that cities are on the path of reducing vulnerability and securing resilience um, of citizens and communities, climate action plans are going to keep us on target for that 1.5 future. Um, and they provide a roadmap. So, you know, things come, things appear. We only have the information that we have, but at least the roadmap keeps you on track to help meet that, um, meet that target. Secondly, learning from participants um, about the benefits of this agenda is really, really meaningful and important. Um, and in that, we need to make sure that we prioritize front and center, um, a just transition and making sure that we're inclusive um, and there's fairness in all of these solutions as well. And I think it's really important that we keep that um, forward and, and watch this space for GCOM uh, to kind of bring something forward as well. So um, I'm sure I'll be reaching out to you um, uh, Mayor Tuto um, as well um, on that in particular. Um, we've also heard that cities face similar challenges. We've heard about these extreme um, events. So yes, familiarize yourself with solutions that people are using in other cities, but we know that the local context is really, really important. And that's been really important to see from all the, the sessions today. And finally, um, collaboration is required in order to make your cities um, climate proof. We need the tools, we need the data, we need the solutions, we need the financing, and no one city can do this by itself and has all the answers. Um, so I think that has hopefully summarized the key points that you have shared. Um, it's been an excellent session. Thank you very much. I think there's a closing video that's about to come our way, uh, but thank you from us, from GCOM, and we look forward to future collaboration, and we welcome um, more cities to work with more cities to kind of help uh, develop these roadmaps and implement these excellent ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asma. Thank you to all my marvelous uh, mayors and panelists on the line and to all the audience online. Wishing you all a great continuation of your day, your evening, wherever you are, and keep up with the resilience. Yeah, thank you.